good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Melissa Bynum, Commissioner at Large for District 1, chairing our Public Works and Safety Standing Committee for June 27, 2022. Before I call the meeting to order, I want to announce that some committee members, staff, and public are attending remotely by Zoom as well as on site. All participants joining by phone should please mute your phones when you are not speaking to avoid background noise. During the meeting, please make sure you announce yourself by name and title every time you speak so the public that's observing at home knows who is speaking. This is critical given the number of remote participants and it's also our current guidance from the Kansas Attorney General. The public's allowed to participate by Zoom or submit questions by email prior to the meeting and those will be included in the record of the meeting. The public may also indicate their intent to provide remote public comment by contacting our clerk's office by 5 p.m. on the Thursday before the meeting. The public will also have an opportunity to provide brief comments either by phone or Zoom or from the fifth floor conference room uh, tonight. I will now call a meeting of Public Works and Safety Standing Committee to order and would the clerk please call the roll. Roll call, Gurneman. Here. Kane, we do have a communication that he will be absent and we have Commissioner Johnson sitting in. No, he's not sitting in, he's regularly on the committee. Sorry. We don't have anyone sitting in, I don't believe, Clerk. Uh, Markley? Here. Johnson? Here. Ramirez? Here. Bynum? Here, thank you. We do not have any revisions on our agenda tonight and our first order of business is minutes from April 25. Markley, move to approve the minutes. Second, Ramirez. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. Roll call on the minutes, please. Roll call. Groneman? Aye. Markley? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Thank you. The minutes are approved. The committee agenda item number one is a grant with the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department Victim Services Advocate uh, for fiscal 2023. Who is, hello. Are you Miss Medina? Please come forward and present, and you can just turn on the microphone. Yeah, come all the way up. I don't recognize you in person. Okay, great. Yes, please uh, go ahead and tell us about your grant for fiscal 23. Good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Wendy Medina, and I'm the program supervisor for Kansas City, Kansas Police Department's Victim Services Unit. And today I am requesting permission to submit our application and then subsequently uh, accept the VOCA Victims of Crime Act grant for fiscal year 2023. VOCA has funded our Victim Services Unit since our inception in 1999. <laughs> Three full-time victim services unit personnel are currently funded by VOCA at 75% and two full-time positions at our newer order of protection office are funded at 100%. If the victim services unit is not able to receive VOCA funding, it would be reduced to only one advocate, which would significantly limit the services available to victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, and survivors of homicide. The current VOCA grant year provided us with uh, $364,025 in federal funds. The required match funds were waived for this fiscal year under a VOCA fixed legislation due to the pandemic. And for the next fiscal year, uh, the proposed budget draft, um, I'm requesting $361,000 and $340 in federal VOCA funds. I've already received some notification from the Kansas Governor's Grants Office that we are anticipating another VOCA fix legislation match waiver for the 2023 grant cycle. Therefore, there is no match requirement from KCKPD in 2023. Um, one significant change in the budget is within the personnel line, line item. I have calculated a race for response advocate two. She recently graduated with her bachelor's degree and her um, salary level would now be consistent with, for example, PFA advocate two, who possesses currently the same education level and similar experience. But this slight increase in personnel is offset by two main expenses. 
One is a decrease in or fringe due to the actual health plans that were chosen by the staff. Um, they're significantly less than what we budgeted for last year since we had some open positions at the time of the grant application last year. Um, and also a decrease in the salary, salary rate actually paid to PFA Advocate 1. That position had a larger, larger budget due to being open at the time of the grant application last year. And then a lesser rate based on her education experience was eventually offered. So in 2023, our unit expects to be fully staffed with a program supervisor, myself, two response advocates, two order protection advocates, one lethality assessment coordinator, and one administrative assistant. In summary, I am requesting a similar federal funding level as last year's, just a little bit uh, less, resulting in no additional funds from the police department than had already been committed. Thank you very much. Are there questions from our committee? Mark, they move to approve. Johnson second, but I have a question. Okay, go right ahead. Um, so these funds that we receive uh, from the federal government, is, I know there's no way to be able to look out into the future, but this is something that we're going to be requesting for the duration as long as those funds are out there, I'm assuming. Correct. Since 1999, the program supervisor has stood before the commission, as I have since 2019 and every single year. Um, we send the same application, and as long as we are meeting the needs of the victims in our city and sending those statistical reports, I'm very confident that they will continue to give us their federal funding. Has there ever been any discussion about what happens if those funds are not available at some point? Yes. Um, our department is always in search of other funding resources for the victim advocates and victim services that we provide. So, for example, um, this past year with our legalities of supporting the new position, um, we work with the Kansas Governor's Council, who's in a different grant, ICJR. Um, I'm blanking on those initials, pardon me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we definitely seek additional sources. Um, should the vote the grant become unavailable one day. And I hope it never does. Yes, I hope it helps for you and others across uh, the state as well. I agree. Well, thank you for answering that question. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. We have a motion and a second, and I just have a quick comment. Kudos to you and, and your team uh, for the match support for one thing that's really helpful to the unified government obviously to the police department uh to your team for everything you do i'm pretty sure it's another one of those jobs i don't want so i really appreciate the you know the work that you're doing in the community and then to your to your team members who have um expanded and completed higher education so send our Congratulations to them on that as well. So we do have a motion and a second on the item. I guess I should stop and ask our clerk if we've had any comments from the public on the item. No communication received. Is there anyone here in person that would like to speak on the item? I do not see anyone coming forward. All right. And there is a motion and a second. So please uh, roll call. Roll call Groneman. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Ramirez. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Markley. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. Motion carries. Thank you. Good luck. Our second item on the agenda is a resolution authorizing our Kansas City, Kansas Police Department into enter into an interlocal cooperation agreement with the Kansas City, Missouri Board of Police Commissioners. And I see Chief Carl Oakman coming forward to tell us about this resolution. And I think we also have Casey Meyer from legal. So um, whichever you wants to get started. Chief. All right. There we go. Okay, so um, officer involved critical incident. Um, this is an agreement between uh, KCK PD and the KCMO police department. Um, and one of, one of the reasons for this is to, uh, one, make sure that our <clears throat> police department is transparent, um, and then reliability in the officer-involved shooting investigations, and then quick response times, and then this would make us consistent with national best practices. So 
uh, let me talk about it just a second here on the reliability in the investigations. Um, in the past, we've used, and I believe it was probably two to three years ago, where the KCK had the I-70 shooting team. And the purpose of that was to make sure that um, members of the KCK police department were not investigating their own members on the police shootings. Uh, so that was group was made up of Topeka and some other um, jurisdictions. Um, with the change in leadership in the Topeka Police Department, that fell apart. Um, so uh, Kansas City, Kansas uh, had to rely on investigating the shootings with their own uh, detectives. Uh, Johnson County as a police shooting team that just does all of Johnson County. Um, we discussed joining that, but they were not um, interested in working with us on the police shooting team. Um, and then the KBI, which was the fallback. Um, the problem with the KBI is they're, they're, they're spread so thin throughout the state of Kansas, which the majority of police departments in the state of Kansas are rural departments. So the KBI not only have to investigate police shootings, but just about every other major crime. So um, this is where we get the quick response times. So on average, we were looking at anywhere from three to six hours for the KBI uh, to be in place. And as we know from best practices, even with Ferguson, uh, leaving an individual on the street that long is very problematic. So that was another issue. And then, like I said, it's consistent with best practices where we're not um, investigating our own um, individuals. But uh, KCMO, which Highway Patrol now does theirs, so that freed up um, KCMO's police shooting team who can respond quickly and investigate our shootings. And uh, KCMO would handle the, the whole investigation as well as the evidence. Um, they would just be in contact with our DA. And when working with FOP4 and the district attorney's office and the Kansas state attorney general, all three was in agreement. So what I like to say, if all three of those entities can agree, it must be a good idea. So um, that's, and I'll let Casey go into the legal um, issues with it. Okay, so obviously since KCMO is in Missouri, we um, had to accomplish this through an interstate compact. Um, an interstate compact requires the, the state attorney general's office approval. So um, I've already submitted that to the state attorney general. They have approved it as far as complying with our state statute. This agreement also requires approval from our Unified Government Board of Commissioners and the Kansas City, Missouri Police Board of Commissioners. Um, this agreement as submitted to you is the same one that is in front of them on the Missouri side this month. Uh, like like, like uh, Chief said, FOP has already approved this. Um, a couple things I wanna note about how this will work. This, the process will be for criminal investigations only. Administrative investigations will be handled by the, um, the involved agency. And we need to do that to comply with both FOP and MOUs on both sides of the state. But um, the responding agency, as Chief said, will be handling the full criminal investigation and will be handling the records and evidence during the pendency of the investigation, um, as well as while it's being reviewed by the district attorney. In addition, the involved agency, and just to be clear, when I say involved agency, that would be the agency who has been involved in the uh, officer involved critical incident, will have um, a liaison, excuse me, I don't know what I did. We'll, have a liaison available just to help the responding agency with uh, local jurisdictional issues. And uh, the term currently, the agreement will be valid up to 10 years, but it can be terminated by either party within 30 days notice. 
and I've already covered all of this. So what we're requesting is um, approval of the resolution authorizing the agreement. Thank you, Chief and, and Casey, I appreciate the information. Are there questions? Uh, I Okay, Commissioner Johnson and then Commissioner Ramirez. Um, Chief, is there any type of, or Casey, is there any type of budgetary um, uh, allotment tied to these to this agreement between either party? Well, that's the um, great thing about this is that due to the minimum number that we have each year, um, there is no uh, financial cost to us that um, KCMO will handle it. Um, and what that's why we're doing the agreement because if for some reason um, they get in a bind with highway patrol can't respond, then we would be the next agency to respond to assist them. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, Bynum. For just my knowledge, what, what's the difference between the criminal investigation and the administrative investigation? What in the Basically, the, the criminal investigation is um, <clears throat> as you, until you determine, like we do with all uh, police involved shootings, I mean, that is technically a homicide investigation. Um, and then once it's determined if it was just justified, then um, it's submitted, it's a case that's being submitted to the prosecutor. Then the prosecutor determines whether or not to file charges. Um, the administrative is is that on all police shootings that we have, or even criminal investigations, once they've been cleared through the prosecutor, we then do administrative investigations to make sure that there weren't any policy violations. For example, um, your shooting could have been justified, but we could have noticed that you violated some department policy. So that's why we would do the administrative investigation. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? All right. All right. We have a motion and a second on the item, and we'll take roll. Roll call: Groneman. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Ramirez. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Markley. Aye. And the motion carries. We thank you both so much for the work that you've put in. I think it'll be very important work for the community, and we'll bring dividends. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. And our last item on this agenda is a presentation of Public Works for their quarterly report. Mr. Fisher, I was curious, are there any Public Works employees here tonight? Are there any? Or did we leave any Public Works employees at their offices? Uh, why don't you bring your team forward and we'll get ready to hear your presentation. All right, who's kicking us off? All right, go right ahead. All right, Jeff Miles, Fleet Manager, the Fleet Services uh, Division of Public Works. Tonight, we're presenting our Public Works Quarterly Update. This is our third one that we've presented starting back in 2021. Today, we have presenting Mr. Vinny Balacci, Joe Barnes, uh, Water Pollution Control, and uh, Diana Jimenez, Public Works Office Manager. The quarterly report, one of the things that we do definitely like to focus into is where we've been, where we're at today, and where we're going. We also have Mr. Dave Reno. Everybody knows Mr. Dave Reno. He's here for moral support as well as preparing us today uh, to always make us shine. Also, we have Mr. Jeff Fisher sent back with our team members there uh, by our public works director. Um, we appreciate that he trusts and empowers the public works team with these opportunities to present our work that we're very proud of. 
Most importantly, as you already mentioned, Commissioner, we have a lot of team members here in the back of the room that are uh, here to not only see our presentation, but has participated in many of the successes that you're gonna see in this presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Joe. Joe's gonna start off the presentation. Thanks, Jeff. Joe Barnes, Project Manager, Water Pollution Control. So our first slide here is a, a new initiative uh, for Public Works is to become accredited through APWA, American Public Works Association. So in the US, municipalities, city governments, um, only about 1% of departments are accredited with APWA. Um, so we've been challenged to become one of those top 1% by our leadership. And so last year, uh, Jeff Fisher sent out an email seeking somebody to manage this program, this project, this initiative. And so there was a group of eight team members, um, team members from each division within um, our public works department. Uh, we were selected to move forward and be accreditation managers. Um, so as, as you can see from the photo on the slide, um, a couple of weeks ago, we held an APWA accreditation kickoff event with all of public works department. So we went over the process. What is APWA? What are, we, what are we in for? What are the benefits of this? And so it was well received. We had speakers from um, American Public Works Association. We had other municipalities show up and talk about how, how, is, how the process went, how it affected them and the, the lessons learned and the benefits their organization have seen. Um, so accreditation, what, what does that really mean for the unified government? And it's really developing best practices, going through as an organization, as a department, as small work groups, going through and talking about how do we do business? What do we do day to day? How can we be more efficient? How can we improve on what we currently do and get those put down on paper and, and get those all sent in a centralized location and in a format that, that uh, APWA recognizes? Um, so we think some of the benefits through going through this would just be our team members talking to each other, talking about how to do things. We're going to foster collaboration, um, team building, communication. Um, Public Works also has a lot of folks that are going to be retiring in the next one to five years. So getting that knowledge that's in their heads and putting it down on paper before they walk out the door. And this is going to this is going to help staff su uh, provide succession planning to those next uh, leaders in the organization. Um, and so this is a new endeavor for us. We don't know exactly how this is going to go, but our accreditation team thinks that this is going to take between one and two years to fully implement. And then the next slide, um, it's not a shocker to anybody, but um, we have cost increases. So everybody, not just UG uh, Public Works, not just the UG as a whole, all of us as citizens of the United States are, are challenged with you know, rising cost. So some of our projects are coming in 20, 30% higher than they, they have in the past. So what does that mean? We just wanted to get in front of you and let you know that we're, we're trying to do the best we can and maximize the dollars that we have been allotted and really put those, put those in the ground or put those in the pavement or put those into products that, that we're buying, that we're trying to do the best that we, we really can, but know that, that Projects may be a little bit smaller than they have in the past due to, due to the prices that we're seeing. Also, the availability of goods and material, you know, our project durations may be pushed out. We may be waiting longer to get material on site to, to actually get things done. So we just wanted to remind you that, that we are thinking about it. We are planning. We are trying to do the best with, with the dollars that we've get, been given. Ben Spalacci, manager of the street division. So we're constantly looking at ways to improve operations and create efficiencies. So one way we've done that is earlier this month, we took possession of a new spray patcher. So basically what this does is carries dry rock, it carries asphalt emulsion, and you see the tube on the front there, it basically makes asphalt on the spot. So another way this helps is it's operated by one crew member opposed to three or four person patch team. Uh, can patch potholes in as little as two minutes. So really helps the street preservation program as a whole. Uh, continuing with street maintenance. So we all know the pavement condition index is continuing to decline across the city. 
uh, with those declining, the maintenance cost is going to go up. So kind of along with Joe, with the inflation, it's going to even be more profound, uh, more potholes. So we may need to add additional pothole trucks and additional staff to take care of those. Good evening, Diana Jimenez, Public Works' office manager. Before we head into these next slides, I kind of want to uh, talk about what com continuous improvement means to our team. Diana, is your microphone on? Yes. Okay, just pull it a little closer. Do you want me to start? A little louder and closer so we can hear you. Thanks. Right. So over the previous four years, Public Works has committed to build a, a great culture, a culture that embraces change, um, that uh, identifies challenges and not accepting the status quo. Um, with a great culture, we value developing leaders around us and at all, at all levels. Um, continuous improvement involves a constant evaluation of the way we do business and the way we serve our community. On the next um, slides are some examples of the culture in action. So listed on here, um, the street division did a reorganization in 2019. Um, they grouped like services into three functional groups um, to increase efficiencies. They um, also added the pothole patcher, although the pothole patcher is um, a great um, thing for their department. Um, as we all know, the street conditions uh, continue to decline according to the data gathered over the last uh, few years. Um, as they continue to, to decline, Public Works will have to purchase more equipment. Um, the engineering division did start some fact sheets. Um, that is a, a letter and a fact sheet is sent out to neighborhoods when uh, they have upcoming projects in their area. Um, so although engineering, the data collection, and street division are making improvements, um, they're not alone. Um, the fleet division has improved um, change, uh, improved cultures and have also made some changes. The fleet services did start their internal service fund. Um, this fund um, actually helps um, with the culture of a culture of ownership. Each department takes better care of their vehicles and equipment and also reduces long-term costs. In 2019, the fleet division did a reorganization in order to increase efficiencies. Um, they did increase customer satisfaction and decreased vehicle downtime. Um, another um, program that they did implement was the Enterprise Vehicle Program. Um, this actually helps the UG uh, with their image. It helps with employee retention, helps with safety, and also creates revenue. Um, the last item on here is the online, um, online permitting system. This system was actually created by Jake and our asset management team um, in-house. This is a, a, a really great system. And not only do uh, can customers go online and apply for a permit, they can also view um, um, the map on, web, on the website with any right-of-way projects in KCK. In public works, it is um, important um, to be great at what we do. Um, in August of 2021, a small continuous improvement group was formed. This group um, began to think about what does public works look like five years from now, 10 years from now, and what should we continue to do? What should we not be doing? That group has now grown this year up to 35 to 40 people. Um, and listed on here on the screen are some actionable items. Um, the first one is increasing internal and external communication. Um, how have we done that? A way that we've done the internal communication are the roundtables. Um, we have two sessions a year with um, our team members. And then um, the external communication, uh, an example would be the engineering fact sheets that are sent out to neighborhoods with upcoming projects. Um, the second one on here is the SOAR program. What are their next steps? Um, we do believe that this is a great program, should be continued. It probably is ready for that next step, but what does it look like? Um, the third one on here is get out, get out of the fueling business. I think the Fleet Services Division would admit they're not great at doing that. So they're reevaluating their involvement in this. And maybe they can, that can allow them to repurpose their time on something that they're great at. Um, the fourth one on here um, just came up 
a couple of weeks ago is, um, should we in public works group like services? Um, and also maybe restructure what public works looks like today. Um, so given these um, few action items and some examples in the previous slides, public works has been and will continue to reevaluate re everything that we do in order to become great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we're just open for any questions. If you guys happen to have any questions on the presentation or anything else going on in public works. Commissioner Merkley. I don't have any questions. I just want to say, um, you know, you guys are rock stars. You're, you're using goal setting and analysis of your department in a way that um, we hope all of our departments will in the long term. You, you guys know I appreciate your uh, use of data in your everyday lives as well. Um, just appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate how Jeff has um, brought leadership up through the department in a way that we didn't have in the past as well. And I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. You did a great job tonight presenting everything that you're working on. I know this is just the tip of the iceberg in, in terms of what you're working on. So I appreciate your work. Appreciate all the times that you guys answer questions for me on behalf of constituents as well. And um, yeah, you're doing a great job. Thanks so much. Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Commissioner Bynum. I appreciate everything that uh, Commissioner Markley said, and Jeff, and to your staff and your team. Uh, thank you for everything that you do. Um, you guys are very persistent with us, continue to be persistent with us. Um, we know it's, you know, many departments fighting for the same finite resources. Um, but as we always said, our infrastructure is the most important part of what we do. We don't have workable roads and bridges, we can't have economic development, we can't have people move in. So thank you for all that you do. Um, as I said, keep that persistence up. Um, the one question I had, um, I think this might be for Jeff. We had a discussion and we gave the green light about the need phase budget for our CMIP. With the presentation of the talk about increased costs, does that give you and your staff more flexibility to be able to deliver projects with a needs-based budget or rather than what we've done in the past? <laughs> it's a good question. I appreciate that. Uh, a needs-based budget certainly would help the Public Works Department meet the expectations of the community and the, the needs around infrastructure. I believe there's work going on internally with finance and uh, budget and CAO and, and Public Works uh, to figure out how we get there. Uh, I think that work is ongoing. As of uh, a couple of hours ago, there was a discussion I was a part of. So uh, I think uh, over the next and in, in ahead of Thursday's budget workshop, maybe there'll be additional discussion around that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it yeah. Did. thank you. And uh -huh. again, thank you for all that you do. Sure, thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Fisher. Yeah, Fisher. Uh, first of all, I, I do want to appreciate, as already been said, that you're pushing your leaders forward. That's the kind of leadership style that I um, kind of see. As the uh, as the proper way to, to do it, and and uh, I think it empowers them, and it prepares them to be their better selves. Um, and I also want to appreciate the way that you all graciously engage with this commission. Um, I know it's not easy to always deal with ten uh, single-minded persons, uh, but we appreciate the fact that you all keep coming back and uh, graciously engaging with us. Um, I want to ask Christian's question a different way. Um, in terms of what's going on in terms of the economy, um, 30 to 35%, when you put it in those kind of numbers, it really kind of causes you to, I mean, we know, that we know that there's an increase, but when you put it in percentages and numbers, it really speaks to, to the way that I look at, at life. And so um, I'm gonna ask, is there, are there any additional projects or are, are there any projects that were submitted on the current CMIP that are affected by these, these changes in, in the economy? I would say that anything, um, including the CMIP right now, is, is vulnerable. Yes. That's just the way we see. And I'm assuming that that's going to, that is causing 
some somewhat of a volatility in terms of how you look into the future three to five years out as well. Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're just, you know, it seems like we try to make two or three steps forward and something comes and, you know, pulls, pulls us back a little bit. So, um, you know, I would just say, just make sure that we are uh, continuing to understand that that 30 to 35 percent, I would continue to say that to us to keep us okay on our heels to understand that these, these are the reasons why we may not be seeing some of the things that we're in, we've been anticipating to come in the near to, to midterm future. So, okay, I just want to put that out there. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. I guess I have comments that are probably questions and probably sound a lot like what you both were just saying that I'm again, I'm looking at the same slide with the cost increases. And so first of all, you have a slide that says two signal projects bid for 30% more than previous years. Do you mean traffic signals? Is that what you're referencing? Yes. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then asphalt has increased just since fall of 21. Asphalt's up 35%. Um, and then there was a comment made about, you know, if we can't keep up, then we have more work for the spray patcher and, and you know, that creates cost as well. But I guess I'm thinking, you know, are you penny wise or pound foolish? And I, uh, did I say that backwards? <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess in my mind, and I'm, I'm speaking rhetorically for all of us, um, we need to get the projects done, right? We need to get the roads resurfaced. I mean, in my mind, we need to spend the money so that we're not patching potholes all day long, if that makes any sense at all. And so, I mean, I feel like the commission has, has heard the call, maybe, you know, finally, and that we're trying very hard to get increases into this coming budget, specifically for streets, bridges, infrastructure, streetlights, etc. Um, and, you know, being really prudent with our expenditures, I feel like makes us penny wise instead of pound foolish because we don't want to just have to patch pop. We can't just have patching potholes be the best we can do is what I'm trying to spit out. And I guess I'm seeing you nod in agreement and we want to help you as best we can. And we do appreciate um, all the time an investment you've made with us so that we understand the situation that we find ourselves in. And I just, it's, it's frustrating to me that we've spent a lot of labor and capital on getting us to see the light. And we're faced with this economic situation because it's because the dollars that we give are just going to buy less than maybe what we had hoped they would. But, but we do trust that, that you spend as efficiently as you can. We do believe that. I just had a, anybody can answer this, but you were uh, talking about your continuous improvement group and the roundtables and whatnot. And it made me wonder if a commissioner we're interested in uh, a more involved level of participation in one of the ways that you are roundtabling or training, or would you uh, allow that? How could a commissioner be engaged more? And I know we've spent a lot of time together, so you may not want to see us much more often, but I mean, I truly think some of us, you know, may want to keep learning and engaging. So how would you go about allowing us to do that? Um, I can send you more information on it, um, give you the dates that um, when we meet, 
Um, before the round tables, we actually have a committee. Um, I think last year we had one commissioner come out and kind of just hear what we talked about and some of the things that were discussed. So um, I can send you that information. Okay. Is there ever a pizza involved or a snack? I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. Salad. Yeah, it's just salad. Okay. <laughs> Uh, BPU board member Groneman, anything from you on, on anything you've heard? Oh, I just enjoyed uh, listening and, and learning and hearing what's going on and uh, being able to take it back right. to our board and staff. Uh, any relevant uh, things? I think that things I've heard in the past, things that I've heard in the past is I think that uh, BPU and that the uh, public works are working a lot closer together. And I and I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. As you can see, we have a lot of good teammates here tonight to represent our culture of continuous improvement. We appreciate them and being here tonight. So Great. Well, time. we obviously are very pleased to have you and hear hear your updates and and your and your planning. It's very important. So thank you all so very much for your time tonight. And that is, I believe. Uh, the last item on our public works and safety agenda. And Mr. Groneman, as always, we thank you for your time. And this meeting is adjourned and I will hand it over to Commissioner Markley for Administration and Human Services. I might just say that uh, at the BPU, we're feeling the same pain <laughs> with our... Team, I'm going to give just a minute for our public works friends to make their way to the door so you get a short break. <laughs> All right, friends, before I call this meeting to order, I want to announce that some committee members, staff, and public are attending remotely via Zoom as well as on site. All participants joining by phone should mute their, mute their phones when not speaking to avoid background noise. During the meeting, please make sure that you announce yourself by name and title every time you speak so the public that is observing knows who is speaking. This is critical given the number of remote participants and is current guidance from the Kansas Attorney General. The public is allowed to participate by Zoom or submit comments by email prior to the meeting, and those comments will be included in the record of this meeting. The public may also indicate their intent to provide remote public comment by contacting the clerk's office by 5 p.m. the Thursday before the meeting. The public also will have an opportunity to provide brief comments either by telephone or via Zoom from the fifth floor conference room of the Municipal Office Building. I will now call the meeting of the Administration and Human Services Standing Committee to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Roll call. Kane? We do have communication. He's going to be absent. Johnson? Aye. I'm mean, here. Ramirez? Here. Bynum? Here. Here. There are no revisions to tonight's meeting. We have no minutes to approve due to the cancellation of our April 25th meeting. So we'll go right on to our committee agenda. Our first item resolution um, is a resolution establishing a sister city relationship with the city of Carmago. I'm probably saying that wrong. Somebody know, say it. Okay, see, I'm not as bad as I thought. Um, in Mexico, and I'm not sure. Oh, come on up. Welcome. Hello. Hi, um, I'm Jeff Andesen. I'm the legal intern for the mayor's office this summer. I'm really excited to be here and meet all of you and learn a lot about governmental processes in Wyandotte County. Um, so we have our friends from Mexico joining us via Zoom. Um, if you have any questions specifically 
about the about their city or anything about them. Um, we worked the marriage office, of course, me being a legal intern, I can't offer any legal advice yet. Um, so we worked closely with the legal department. They helped us throughout the whole process. So if we have any um, questions about the process or anything of the implications, anything like that, please um, do not feel free to feel free to ask. Um, and if you would like me to read the proclamation, I absolutely can do that for you. Um, like. The committee would like to hear the proclamation. Perfect. So this is a proclamation, whereas Wyandotte County was established in 1859 and its development and growth can be attributed to many persons, both indigenous and immigrant, who toiled and endured the challenging area by and around the confluence of the Kansas and Missouri rivers. And whereas special recognition must be given to the Mexican immigrants who provided countless political, faith, community, business, labor, and educational leaders. And whereas Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas has encouraged and continues to develop connections with our ancestors through our formal sister city relationship. With cultural, educational, and business ties with Linz, Austria, European Mexico, Limerick Island, and Karlovic, Croatia. And whereas a formal sister city relationship between the city of Carmago and Wyandotte County, Kansas, has been requested to exchange cooperation in programs and projects of machinery and equipment, medical support, initiate and open lines of trade and manufacturing, agronomics and tourism through responsible use of the environment and culture, as well as to provide any support and or management that is deemed convenient for the development of each municipality. Now, therefore, I, Tyrone A. Garner, Mayor CEO of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas, do hereby proclaim that there exists between the city of Carmago, Chihuahua, Mexico, and the Wyandotte County, Kansas, a formal twinning, and that we will now and forever be in a special relationship. It witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand and the seal of the United Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas on this day. Thanks so much. Any other questions or comments? We have a yes. We have um, a Michael Dean with a hand up. I don't know if that's our representative. That is our representative. Um, if we could. Can you hear me? Uh, hear me? Yeah, I sure can. Go right ahead. Hey, my name is Michael Dean. I am the uh, chairman and the founder of Merancho Tequila in uh, Jalisco, Mexico. I am here today with the mayor of Camargo, Chihuahua, Mr. Jorge Adana, the city administrator, Mr. Salvador Cardoza, and the deputy city administrator, Mr. Alvaro Alvarado. They have been very instrumental in putting this sister city agreement together along with the people of Wyandotte County and the administration's government that is in place at this time. And if you have any questions, we stand here ready to answer any and all questions on the behalf of Camargo Chihuahua. Thank you so much for being on here with us. I look forward to a long and fruitful relationship between our two cities. Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Markley. Uh, just thank, I want to thank the mayor's office for doing this and for um, all of the, the officials from Carmago. Thank you for willing to work with us. Um, coming from a uh, immigrant family, my uh, father came from Mexico City and all of my grandparents came from Jalisco. So uh, it's, I understand where, especially the, the district that I partially represent along with Commissioner Markley is a, was a big immigrant, Mexican immigrant community um, and a rich, rich culture and history within Argentine. So I'm very excited that we have done this. And so then thank you to the mayor and thank you to the um, officials in Caramago. Commissioner Bynum. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Merkley. I appreciate your comments, Commissioner Ramirez. I'm excited about the Sister City Proclamation. Um, we are, you had named the other sister cities that we have. One of them is also in Mexico. I was just a young girl when I was afforded the opportunity to uh, make what I think was our very first sister city trip to Urapan, Michoacan, Mexico. And it was, I was, I was in high school and uh, it was amazing. Um, and I think that has just kept my interest 
all these years in these sister city relationships. Um, so I guess I would say two things. If our friends from Mexico could maybe come visit or if we could somehow uh, create an exchange trip to Mexico, either way, I would be delighted. And I don't know if that's uh, feasible as a part of the you know, resolution necessarily, but hopefully it could be uh, something that we could look forward to in the future. So welcome, friends. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Commissioner Markley. Um, Mr. Dean, maybe you could tell us maybe about, give us a real high level view about um, the city that you represent. Um, either you or the administrator or assistant administrator, maybe one of you all could give us just a high level um, shot of, of your city. Okay. Um, well, on my left, I have the mayor, Mr. Jorge Adana, and on my right, I have uh, the city administrator. Camargo is, what I want you to know in Kansas City, there are approximately 6,500 people that live in the Kansas City, Kansas area that are directly from Camargo, Chihuahua, Mexico. Camargo, Chihuahua, Mexico has approximately 55,000 people live in Camargo. It's a primarily agricultural town where its primary products are pecans, tomatoes, peppers, um, chipo chili, chipotle. They're one of the largest producers of chipotle chilies in the world here. And they 80% uh, of the economy is based in agriculture. They are fully involved in the, uh, uh, the way of life here versus trying to coincide with the way of life in Kansas City, Kansas for the people that live there. Many of them who have uh, their parents live here in Camargo or have siblings that live here in Camargo. So it's very well known Kansas City, Kansas in this region for being very sensitive and very helpful to the people of Camargo Chihuahua. Camargo Chihuahua looks to fortify its relationship with Kansas City, Kansas in as many ways as possible that both cities can work together. They are planning a trip in the near future, within the next 60 to 90 days to visit Kansas City, Kansas and the government of Kansas City, Kansas, the mayor and uh, the deputy um, city administrator at this time they they are very happy and they are very excited for the future relationship that is at hand okay i just asked him if they were saying they're very uh very excited and very happy alvaro okay well they're they're kind of quiet right now but if you have any questions direct i'll take the questions i can translate them over for you if you have any direct questions for the mayor city administrator or deputy city administrator of camargo chihuahua we are meeting you the right now in the city in the chambers of the city council at this time oh okay that's wonderful thank you for that that kind of overview of the city that really helps to, to understand and i did not know we had that many persons living in wyandotte county from that area of, of uh of the region there. So thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. If there are no other questions, uh, the primary order of business will be uh, a motion to formalize this relationship. Johnson, second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Roll call. Markley? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Hi. Thank you so much and welcome to the family. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Our next order of business is an ordinance amending sections of chapter 32 of the 20, uh, 2008 Code of Ordinance and Resolutions. And Gunnar Hand is here to speak with us today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can everybody hear me okay? Sure can. I have a very bad track record speaking into these things with my mask. I apologize. All right, I do have a presentation um, for you all this afternoon. Um, I'm actually going to be speaking to both this agenda item and the next agenda item. Um, together, we're calling them our Streets for People Ordinance. If you could just give us one second while we boot that up or bring it up. It's, uh, I don't see it on that screen. That one, bottom left, yep. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, let's try this again. All right, so good evening again, commissioners. Uh, my name is Gunnar Hand, Director of Planning and Urban Design for the Unified Government. Again, the proposed ordinances before you tonight, uh, one of which came uh, with unanimous recommendation for approval from the Planning Commission. That's the one regarding Chapter 27, not Chapter 32, which is um, uh, public right of way and does not go through the City Landmarks Commission. Uh, um, uh, represents the making permanent of all of our COVID-19 emergency ordinances and resolutions uh, put together at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in the summer of 2020. Um, these ordinances resolutions have been reauthorized on multiple occasions by this board, most recently to sunset this Thursday, June 30th, 2022. So again, in the summer of 2020, um, we put together over the course of that summer, five ordinances and two resolutions that set standards for business, businesses to, uh, excuse me, for business activity in the public realm, as well as cutting the red tape for businesses to move quickly. If you recall at that time, we were all trying to do something in response and try to get our economy back in order after, <clears throat> after the mass, uh, mass closings. So when you look at um, the reasons as stated in those original ordinances and resolutions on why we are doing these ordinances, things like creating more activity and vibrancy in our commercial corridors, supporting lo local entrepreneurs, all those things are still very much valid today. The only thing that has changed, even though we are still in a pandemic, is we no longer have the health orders around those pandemics, at least currently. And so the presentation tonight is really just an overview of things that are already in place and already the rule of the land today. Again, they sunset on Thursday, but the point being, before these emergency ordinances, it was illegal in the unified government to do your business outside of your four walls, which is not a best practice, I would say. <clears throat> So again, these ordinances will continue to support local businesses and neighborhood vitality. Again, we have sections specifically for outdoor service and sales. This is outdoor retail, outdoor cafes, the expansion of farmer markets, mobile vending, i.e. Food, uh, food trucks, mobile market. Our mobile market section is tailored specifically to the dot mobile market as it is the only mobile market in the UG. And it came as a, its own ordinance prior to the pandemic. So we sort of just kind of made it easier for the mobile market to get around. Um, so it's an amendment of an existing ordinance. And then the open streets program, which I'll get into a little bit more detail. This is not for every single type of business. This is restricted to certain types of business. Again, over the course of the summer of 2020, we did add a couple of businesses, namely outdoor taverns to this list. Um, but you still cannot be an appliance store and bring your washer and dryer outside to the sidewalk and, and try to sell it. You cannot do repair work outside of your four walls, right? You cannot be a pawn shop and bring things out and try to sell them out on the street. And the way we accomplish this is we set a certain number of standards um, for each of these types of uses, specifically starting with where you can operate um, these uses outside of your four walls. Um, so after two years of implementation and testing and enforcing and tweaking, what you see in these ordinances is really a tightening of the screws than it is any massive changes. So we made a couple of tweaks here and there that we think improve the, the uh, standards, improve safety, and overall keep things moving along uh, as we have. Um, so again, we have sections that clearly define where you can do these outdoor sales. In this, um, in this instance, is it's the it's the sidewalk and the public right of way, it's the front side and rear yards on in your parcel, um, uh, it's in the street in a parklet if it's if it's available, um, and then it's in that off street surface parking. Again, that's also in your parcel. So one of the big things that we had to do through this is it's real easy to write a resolution and say don't enforce that stuff. Um, but then when you make it person, when you make it permanent, you got to go back into all those code sections and write it. So the stuff we gave you is pretty thick, but it really is just turning those resolutions um, and changing the way we enforce these laws moving forward. So we worked closely with public works. We looked closely with, we went back to the well, right, with all the working groups, fire, police, public works, public health, um, business licensing, and others um, who originally drafted the 
five ordinances and two resolutions to go back and re, um, reassess this. So again, we took all those lessons learned and applied them to this um, uh, Streets for People ordinance. So as it comes to safety standards, again, this is a big focus for us, ADA, oh, sorry, ADA accessibility, um, strong focus still. Um, if you remember in the, when we were doing these emergency ordinances, we put an emphasis on enforceability, asking for forgiveness as opposed to permission, putting a bunch of red tape up front to get things, to get permission to do those things. We haven't really seen too many issues around that approach. Um, we've certainly gone out there and corrected some issues through enforcement after being notified, or we've seen them on the street, but all in all, been pretty, pretty okay. Nothing major. <clears throat> again, when it comes to um, yard standards, again, this is happening inside your parcel, but maybe outside of your building. Um, you have to think about, we have a very diverse uh, community, very di diverse typology in the planning profession, we call them transects, everything from urban to rural and in between. So to write an ordinance for all of those things, even though sometimes when you think about street cafes, you're thinking Central Avenue, Minnesota Avenue, right? Like, well, these still could apply to places on State Avenue, potentially. We just had to, so it's very flexible. We tried to set standards that quite frankly, not everyone's going to meet. Not every parcel necessarily has the right to do this because they will not meet those standards. And that's up, incumbent upon us to then enforce those. <clears throat> When it comes to right-of-way sales, again, this is chapter 32. Um, so it's the next agenda item, I believe. Um, but in terms of right-of-way sales, big emphasis on ADA accessibility, staying out of the vehicle right-of-way, so not in the street, but doing something on the uh, backside of the curb, right, in the sidewalk. We still have a section in here that makes parklets um, um, uh, an as-of-right use. Um, but again, not everybody has street parking. Not everybody is on a street that's less than 40 miles an hour. So that isn't like this is going to proliferate everywhere. There, it will get constrained to certain situations. But if you fit the criteria and you can meet all the standards, you can drop down a, a parklet. Uh, one per parcel is what, is what we're still at. That's what it was originally. That's what it is today. Looking at a couple of pictures about what parklets are. Again, this is an expansion of the public realm. <clears throat> it's about placemaking. Um, and uh, creating vibrancy in our communities. Again, expanding opportunities for business. Now on outdoor taverns, we've had quite a few special use permits for outdoor bars or bars that have outdoor components that we've had quite a bit of conversation with over the last two years. This would change all of that. What we're proposing and what was a very critical point that we had a long, not a long, but definitely had a conversation about at the planning commission hearing was tightening the screws on outdoor taverns. So we put a limit on outdoor taverns. Your bar can be open till 2 a.m. or whatever, but you can't be outside drinking or serving after 10 p.m. And we made that blanket. At one point we thought, well, maybe we could do it in some areas, let it go. And maybe it's okay if it's like a bar that's in a strip mall somewhere, right? They're not really gonna harm anybody if people are out past 10. Again, in order to address the diversity of all typologies across oh, sorry, not coming. At 10 p.m. Commissioner Bynum has a question. Yeah. Like, for example, on the photo you show, um, I certainly can understand what you just said, but did you have concern from I can think of a couple of bars where their outdoor section is behind? So it's not on the sidewalk or the street, it's their own property that's fenced and it's like a back patio. Yep. So does this apply to that? Correct. It does? Yep. I'll bet they were pretty unhappy <laughs> or going to be. <laughs> um, there were a couple of bars who were doing that before the summer of 2020. Right, right. I mean, there's multiple bars that Which have a back it? patio. Yep. And so we're going to tell them they can't be on their back patio that they own after 10 p.m.? Correct. They couldn't be in that back patio before the summer of 2020. This is more than what they are allowed to do. Okay, so... Okay, so when... 
I'm sorry, when Kansas and Wyandotte County and said, you can't smoke inside anymore. A lot of bars built a patio so that people could go outside, take their beverage. I'm really, I've been sitting on the patio of one particular bar for like <laughs> more than a decade. And are you saying that that's been illegal this whole time? Yes. If I stayed it until 1001, or has it always been just period? Not you have not been allowed to conduct your business outside of your four walls until the summer of 2020, legally. Okay. Which again well, speaks to the point of the draconian and outdated nature of that code, which we're trying to fix. So this is an expansion. It might not be an expansion to what they were used to illegally doing. Um, I, I can understand. I'm talking to you all now, I guess, because I can, um, I don't know what the planning commission already saw this. It did. And what'd they say? They wanted it at 10. I can understand the front sidewalk part, um, but I don't know that I understand or agree with the enclosed back patio, I'm on my own property and always have been part. So that's bothering me. Okay. And again, just a suggestion. I mean, I mean our, I'll explain a little bit okay. why we decided to stick with just a blanket 10 p.m. Um, the ins and outs of why it could be extended or why it should not go past 10 p.m. are pretty um, case specific. There are a lot of outdoor patios that abut residential properties. Um, currently in our zoning code, if you're a C1 property and you have an outdoor and there is an outdoor space or outdoor parking within 100 feet of residential zone, you legally have to close at 1 a.m. That became a huge issue with one of our bar SUP renewals um, to the point where we basically threw that out and they got a variance. Um, so that is also an older part of our code, but it speaks to what I could rest our hands, what I could rest our, our current draft on. You can look to other parts of the code and say, well, it made sense to do this there. It could be 1 a.m., but I also get a bunch of complaints when we're up doing these SUPs for these types of bars and restaurants of the people who are around these bars and don't want to listen to them smoking their cigarettes, drinking their beers or whatever till 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, so we tried to meet it in the middle. <laughs> so does this apply across the board? So, for example, the legends, don't they have some sort of overlay yeah, district? Special SUP, which allows for all that outdoor dining. That, is, that would be separate from this. So if someone that this entire. would apply to wanted an SUP, would that take them around the 10 p.m.? Is that a possibility? When we spoke to legal about this, what we said was we couldn't retroactively go back to all those old SUPs that as they came back, we'd have to either realign or make them different. So we have that flexibility if we so choose, but this blanket is the, is the sort of baseline. I'm thinking- Get a separate entitlement and make the case for, but instead of this, what we've been doing these SUPs is based on opposition or what have you, we sort of cherry pick a time. Um, and that's dangerous, right? So I think that what this gives us is a baseline based on the study that we did, um, and the experience we had over the last two years. And then we could, um, as these SUPs get renewed, um, augment it as we see fit. So let's take the easy in as an example. There was opposition to the EZM getting a live permit. So they don't need an SUP for a bar, but they need a live permit. So those types of things, that's where we could limit outdoor use or expand outdoor use um, if we saw fit. But the EZM, again, a bunch of residential properties, we did get opposition to it. 
we weren't exactly sure. The planning commission, I should say, wasn't 100 percent sure where they should land, so they just gave until two o'clock at the cost of all that opposition about that case. Could you tell me again the um, special dispensation of the legends? What did you call it specifically? They, they received a um, indefinite special use permit that allows for all the stuff that goes inside the parcel. And again, if you think, and so, so it's an outdoor mall right. where you do all that walking and shopping and stuff outside. So it, 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 it included stuff about signage okay. in there, but it also included the, the outdoor dining. So right outside of the Legends District, that's probably not included in the permanent SUP that's correct. is a locally owned establishment. Is it one of the pad sites or are you talking like on Parallel Parkway? It's on the north side of Parallel. So it's right. not within the confines of the legends. Right. So it has a disadvantage at this point, being adjacent to the legends and not able to enjoy the freedom uh, that we've granted to the legends shopkeepers. This would extend, essentially, in essence, extend what the Legends has everywhere in the county, except the 10 p.m. for bars. I mean, I'm thinking of the 10 p.m. issue. Okay. Well, is this going to come back to the full commission after we see it? We are asking, sorry, we are asking for this to be fast-tracked for this Thursday because the sunset for these emergency ordinances is this Thursday. Well, I really appreciate everything that you're bringing i i but the 10 p.m is bothering me and, and i'll stop commissioner ramirez thank you commissioner markley i think i understand let me try and i'm gonna give an example i've been to the mockingbird lounge many many many, many a times i've been out on their back patio where people have been drinking this is pre-COVID. So you're saying that was illegal. Yep. Come to by our ordinances. Yep. So all the bars within our county and city have been operating who have a back patio illegally. Yep. How to legal? How did that happen? Uh, I think it's, again, an outdated draconian code meets basic property rights slash best practices. We just never enforced it. Okay. Believe me, we, we were just as surprised in the summer of 2020 when we found that code section. We're just and kept reading it and rereading it and rereading it and rereading it. You know, yep, that's this is exactly what it's saying. Wow. All commercial business is to happen inside the four walls of your building, not the four lines of your parcel. Mm. Or more than four lines, but. Are we the only municipality in the metro that has the same? I wouldn't say the only in the metro, but we were definitely behind the curve on this. Okay. I, I think this would put us ahead of Kansas City, Missouri, if we pass this ordinance. Mm-hmm. I think our current ordinance, again, this same ordinance with some tweaks that's in effect right now, puts us ahead of Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. If that means anything to you. I, I have also some hesitation with the 10 p.m. Um, because, well, now the community knows people are going to hear Bar has been operating illegally, and now we're going to say, nope, we're going to slap on a requirement or a, a stipulation now. So it's, I, 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 get, I get the reason why. I, I do. I do get the reason why. I just don't want to hinder the bars. They've had, majority of these bars have had those patios, all, all everything that's there. Some have um, nicely decorated. And now with this new ordinance, come Thursday, if we pass it, they can no longer use it. Or they could, 
but up until 10, whereas before they're able to use it till they close. I think if we wanted to make a change, I'd have to defer to legal because I don't know where, if we have to go back to city planning or if there's some, like when you guys change recommendations to planning commission, it becomes a super majority or whatever. I don't know how that works between here and standing, but if we did want to make a change, my recommendation would be to keep the 10 PM for, for bars adjacent to residentially zoned properties, which is typically how we talk about other potentially nuisance uses adjacent to residentially zoned properties that would still put places like Mockingbird, Easy Inn and others at the 10 PM. More the, the more urban where quite frankly, I think it's, it's more likely that these things get implemented east of 635 than west just because it's more suitable to an urban environment than it is a traditionally suburban sprawl type environment. Mm -hmm. It's not impossible, but it's it's just more conducive to and prevalent in. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't have any more questions or comments. I'm. And if this is the one thing that holds you guys up, then let's change it and fix it, right? I don't know if we can do it right now, but like, let's change it and fix it. That's fine too. I, it's your choice. But I, I think you would need to refer it back. You have to planning. I think so too. That would be my guess. So we think that if we made a change, it would go back to planning. Uh -huh. I, my change would be Outdoor taverns cease after 10 p.m. if they are on a public sidewalk or right of way. 11 p.m. if they are on their own enclosed private property. I'd give them at least another hour to be on their own private property. Uh, I get why neighbors near a bar that has a patio don't want to listen to that all night. I, I do get that. I guess I'm, you know, thinking of we have, I mean, I can think of half a dozen off the top of my head that actually prior to COVID, but you know, that's, that's a business expense. And then, and then with the strain that we know all of those locally owned businesses went through during COVID with the uh, shortened business hours and, and all of the restrictions that were placed on them um I really bothers me to tell them that after 10 o'clock everybody's got to come in off the patio it just really bothers me um I don't mind telling them to come in off the sidewalk that's not their property okay. I have two more slides do you want me to get through the or do you want to Okay, so just real quick, um, the uh, Streets for People ordinance still allows um, uh, mobile vending in all districts. Um, again, another lesson learned from the last two years, we tightened the screws on mobile vending in residential districts. Um, we also think it's important in the hot summer to remind everybody that uh, mobile vending or food trucks is a different definition than an ice cream truck. So ice cream trucks can still do their thing. They have like their own code section. Um, this is for any other mobile vending truck in residential zones. Um, basically you have to be invited on. That was part of the stipulation before, but we had some, we had some uh, space to allow them near parks and other uses like that. But we had some, not issues, but we had some pushback on allowing those types of businesses in residential districts. And so we just tightened it into, you can, you can show up if somebody invites you basically. So if it's a block party, of course you can do there, but you can't drive around and try to sell your tacos. And quite frankly, I don't think any a taco truck would want to go into the middle of a residential street anyway. That's not where they get their business. So I don't, it wasn't too big of an issue. Um, we had some issues around parks and they asked us to stop doing it basically. Um, and then uh, for farmers markets, this one we were able to touch base um, directly with the operators of our farmers markets in Wyandotte County, and these changed probably more than others in terms of their standards. Um, changes we think and uh, our farmers markets believe will um, help urban agriculture in Wyandotte County. Um, 
in terms of <clears throat> making it easier to hold farmers markets and more farmers markets uh, in the future, which is their plan. It still has the open streets section, which is not too dissimilar from essentially a block party. You still have to get a permit. You still have to designate somebody to be your block captain who manages these roads. But if you've ever seen one of those roads that are one of those signs, that's like a little orange guy with the flag that says drive like your kids live on this street. That's effectively all this is. Um, it's not a closed street. It's not closed for a block party. It's basically closed to local traffic and delivery. And you put up signs um, every day to, to manage that. We've had a couple of people do these. We think it's a good program. It's not a burden on staff. Um, it goes through the same process as the block, um, the block party permit. So it's, it's not too dissimilar. And then I think in conclusion, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, again, Streets for People is all about economic development. It's all about placemaking. It's all about walkability. It's allowed us to clean up all the sections that we touched. Um, there were quite a bit of old stuff errors, um, specifically in accessory use sections for all the zoning districts that we were able to clean up. Um, for instance, uh, we were able to create a um, section for accessory uses for um, uh, ribble glass recycling. As a part of this, we were in the section. It was a section a code section we wanted to fix anyway. Um, so we were able to work with Ripple Glass on creating standards for where they can place their containers, things of that nature. Um, we Again, we went back to the working group uh, within UG staff who's charged with uh, creating and enforcing and administering these things. Um, we're still uh, going to continue education across the UG in terms of and updating all of our collateral materials so people understand what the what the final ordinance says. We'll do our own homework to make sure enforcement is up to par. And then we fully expect to do a, another big outreach push like we did after that summer to notify people and make them aware of these standards and these opportunities, um, but, uh, but also get out there and try to, try to get more parklets, outdoor cafes, and things that improve our street life in Wyandotte County. Um, so with that, I'll happy to take any additional questions. Eagle. It sounds like if we want to make any change regarding the time, that item, and, and there's two items here, so one may be able to proceed separately if that's our will, um, would need to go back to planning with some direction from us. That's correct. Then what would happen on June 30th when the other rule sunset? If it since well, it would be about enforcement. So we legally, you wouldn't be able to do the things that um, we were doing after 2020, but it would be about whether or not that's enforced during the time period it's lapsed. It would effectively be a 30 day lapse. And again, chapter 27 has to go to planning commission. Chapter 32 does not. The way that commissioner Bynum described it, the section as it relates to limiting it to 10 p.m. in the public right-of-way would not have to be changed because that's what it is right now in that language. We would only have to take chapter 27 about changing that to 11 p.m. or whatever for um, uh, outdoor patios on your parcel. Any so again, a lot of this would get covered. The public right-of-way stuff would be good to go. It would just be the stuff inside your parcel that would take another month. And I agree with legal. It'd be a month of disconnect. So any questions just on that procedural portion? I'm, I'm open to the will of the committee, but I wanted to make sure we knew what we needed to do and what could be done. Is your question about that? Okay. <laughs> I think my question is about that. So I... Chapter 27 is where my issue lies. To extend it to 11, yes. And that would go back to planning, but 32, chapter 32 wouldn't. Chapter 32 currently says that um, outdoor taverns and the public right of way have to close at 10 p.m. Ah, okay. 32, which one of them is the 32 one? 32 is public right of way. So 32, we would be good to go. If you guys feel like you're good to go, yes. And 27 is the one where I'm having a problem with the closure time or right. the get off the patio time. Um, 
So is there any precedent for um, extending laws by 30 days? Like, is there any legal authority for us to say, well, instead of having it sunset on June 30th, we will extend this ordinance expiration date by 30 days? Without approval, I don't think the law allows us to do that. So go ahead, Gunnar. We have to send. I think you're right. Right. We, we need to approve it in order to legally extend it. And I did not put together a resolution. Um, okay. I mean, I could quickly put together a resolution extending Chapter 27, but again, I, I've missed the boat on hitting this committee. And well, it's okay. I mean, I should just do it all at planning. Yeah. yeah. And I apologize, Ms. Cobbins just pointed out we could always blue sheet Tony the extension of Chapter 27 on Thursday. So we passed the right of way. Sorry. So we could pass the right of way. The other one, we could blue sheet an item to just continue doing what we're doing. We could send 32 back to planning commission for further discussion. 27. 27 is what we're sending back to planning commission for further discussion on the timeline. And then it would come back separately. Let me let me let me jump in out of the weeds because I, I can't operate in the 27 and 32s. Um, <laughs> before and even with the new proposed ordinance, it seems to me that it really comes down to one, somebody issuing a complaint about somebody being about a business uh, being too loud or operating outside of the current ordinance, which apparently nobody knows about anyway. Right. And secondly, it would take the enforcement of said complaint by PD, I'm assuming. Correct. Right. So, I mean, for me, let's just, we'll get it done when we get it done. You know, and I, and I've, I guess what I'm saying is because if we go ahead and bring it to, and I don't know about the 2732, but whatever it is to full commission on Thursday, we can pull whatever we need to pull off of consent, can't we? And have a further discussion so that the rest of our colleagues could weigh in on this as well, as opposed to dealing with that now. That's that's my okay. input, and you guys can mishmash that into the rest of it. More time. I'm so sorry. If this item did move forward, uh, or either item move forward on Thursday, it would be on the standing committee agenda. It would not be on consent. Because it's fast track. So, okay. so it has to be Which I, yeah. item two is the ordinance amending sections of chapter 32. That is, is or is not where my issue lies. That is the one that can go. That one's good to, go. good to go. Chapter 27 is where I Correct. don't like it. Okay. All right. Um, if I could, and, and clerk, I'll ask if there were any comments received on either of these two items, just for ease of moving along. There was no comments. Okay. Um, Commissioner Johnson. So um, I've been made aware. So this, this apply to with un, under the umbrella of nonprofits, this is applied to churches. Does what apply? All of this? All of this. Correct. It does. I mean, I've been made aware of um, some churches in the inner city that have had persons standing outside on a sidewalk, I assume, um, having challenging conversations. Um, would any of what you're talking about tonight apply to those that it, I guess would give more liberty to those institutions that wanted to say if a, a, a Christian church was having a service and someone that was not Christian wanted to kind of protest that outside of the church, would this give more credence to them be, being able to do this? The ones that are out on the outside challenging them or no? Right. That um, makes sense. The, what you're describing is sounds like a protest. So yes, it would something not. Something like that. It would not apply. What we were thinking of when we wrote specific, uh, when we wrote nonprofits into this was Girl Scout cookies. 
and you could sell those Girl Scout cookies on the sidewalk if you got the property owner's consent. Um, and you were a registered 501c3, right? So basically you can do all this stuff in Wyandotte County if you have a 501c, 501 status, c3, c4, whatever, um, or you have a business license. Those are basically the two things that's, that allow you to proceed and see if you meet the standards and you can do whatever you want to do. So and that person had permission, a, right? So unless your church gave the person permission, even if the protesters somehow had a 501, if the church didn't give them permission to be on the sidewalk, this still wouldn't have Yeah, worked. the Church of Scientology can't set up a booth in front of a church and try to start hawking their books unless you gave them permission to do so. Hmm. That's all. okay. Thank you. I need to know that. Thank you. <laughs> But they can stand there and scream at the top of their lungs at you because they have freedom of speech. And technically they're in the public right away, but they can't put something uh, on the public right away, start selling stuff and not move because they no, want to be there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Markley. Um, I, 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 I'm in the same boat with, as, with you, Commissioner Bynum. It's I personally don't feel comfortable doing that. These bars, on, um, unfortunately, it was illegal, but they had this freedom. And now the local government's coming in and saying, nope, you, you can have it, but up until a certain point. And it's, to me, it's a disservice to them because they've had, like I said, they've had this freedom. They've been able to do it, even though it was illegal by our ordinances. But I do, I, I think at least moving it forward to the full commission to have a fuller discussion with uh, the rest of the commissioners about it. Um, and then and I, I don't even know where to go, go from there because I don't know where my, our other fellow colleagues are going to fall on the issue. So, but I think we should have that fuller discussion as a whole body. And if, if I may, just one more time. Um, so, I agree with you 100% public right away. You can pretty much set whatever standard you want because it's our property, right? Um, and there's really no precedent to, to look to, to, to compare standards. Um, I would caution us if we would do want to change it. Um, and again, although 10 o'clock is somewhat arbitrary, there are code sections that speak to similar types of nuisance uses that are a precedent in our code. I think it would have a stronger standing and certainly would probably be better for the bars, but not necessarily for residents. But again, the code section, although it's specific to C1, speaks directly to what we're talking about, which is having some sort of loud use outside on a property adjacent to residences, and they limit it to one o'clock. So I think that would be a, my professional opinion would be that would be a stronger a uh, hook to hang our hat on than just to say 11. And quite frankly, I'm sure the bars would be happy with that. I don't know where the public reaction would be around that. Although we really haven't had too much outside of isolated, noticed entitlements and people coming out saying, I don't want that bar to have an outdoor bar near my, across the street from my house or across the street from my backyard. Right? Those were, that's where we get most of our feedback on this issue. Does that make sense? I like 11 o'clock. If you guys want to go with 11, it's fine. I, I just think it would be better if we hung our hat on a similar standard elsewhere in the code. And that's kind of what we've been doing elsewhere in this ordinance. Sorry, Commissioner. And I'm just going to interject real fast. Our noise ordinance would still apply regardless. And just for kicks. But we have to know what that decibel level, yeah. Yeah, the decibel level is on those. So the person, it's, it's 65 decibels. decibels. But 65 decibels. The average citizen doesn't know it's 65 decibels. It's a toilet flush. That's the sign of a toilet flush? Yep. Okay. At the property line. <laughs> so if I could hear a toilet flush at the property line, then anything above that, then they are out of, okay. You have to remember, we also, I mean, Peace officers have the ability to enforce this in their own way, but we also don't technically have a machine that like gets an actual reading. Um, well, that, but 65 sounds like it's the decibel, the decibel it's level is fairly low. It's low. So they're okay. There's probably some credence to some of the complaints that I've been made aware of 
uh, with regard to that, which I think is a completely separate issue than what we're discussing right now, I assume, so. Okay. All right, team. <laughs> Let's address item number two, which is at chapter 32, the one that we don't seem to have any disagreement on. So have have a motion. I would make a motion on uh, the ordinance amending sections of chapter 32. Second, Ramirez. I have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Roll call. Johnson? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Markley? Aye. Thank you very much. That brings us to item number three, which as you know, we've been addressing these together, but they're two separate items in our agenda. This is the one where there is some discussion. It will be on non-consent on Thursday, regardless, because it is fast-tracked. So it will be up for discussion regardless on Thursday. I will point out, I would be happy to accept a motion. Move to approve and fast track to the June 30th for fuller discussion with the commission. Johnson, second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Roll call. Johnson? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? No. Markley? Aye. <laughs> Will it still go forward onto the agenda? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. He's dragging us, kicking and stream, screaming into a modern, modern world here. All right. Thank you, everyone, for that discussion. That brings us to item number four, which is our municipal court update. I'm sorry, I didn't. Did we? We need four for a. Okay, so do we need to go back? That was why I was concerned. So it won't even move forward. No. No, it can't move forward unless we have. It doesn't move forward without four votes. Correct. Okay. So, so how do we correct that now, Miss Madam? Well, we, did you want it to move forward? I would prefer it move forward. Okay, so it was just a mistake. So we can recall it and vote again. Let's do that. How do we do that? Tell us what to do. Legal. Resend it and then. Oh, make okay. A motion. So. The yes. motion maker rescinds. Okay, I'll move to approve and fast track to the June 30th commission meeting. No, we have to move. Oh, do you have to say you rescind? Yeah. Well, motion to withdraw. Okay, so second. Commissioner Ramirez makes a motion to withdraw. Yes, Johnson second. Right. Johnson second. Okay. Now vote. Now vote on that. Okay. So, roll call. Johnson? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Aye. Now you motion again. I made a motion to approve and fast track to the June 30th uh, commission meeting. Johnson second. Roll call on that motion. Ben. Roll call. Johnson? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Aye. And thank you for stopping us so that we could do what we intended. I think to do. <laughs> All right, now for our municipal court update. And not only have they been patient this evening, they have been bumped from our agenda several times. So I appreciate their short-term patience tonight and also their long-term patience in getting the chance to come before us and tell us what they have been up to. So welcome. We're looking forward to hearing your report. Welcome. As he's, thank you. As he's getting set up, there's just one thing I didn't want to interrupt, but just a comment to kind of think about what the past issue is um, they're totally unrelated when you have a private property and a, uh, uh, not corporate, but a, a bar. However, if you don't want your neighbor to have a party after 10 p.m., just for your municipal court folks and your enforcement folks, you might think about a bar having something at 11 p.m. when we want our local ordinance to end at 10 p.m. So it's just something to think about. You guys make the laws, um, but it, there are some little pitfalls in here. Um, if you think about it, because it's specifically what I'm hearing is the residential areas. So at that, um, if anybody has any questions for me, because again, that's just a comment, um, Dominic can get going. All right, so I will, I just want to clarify what you just said. So your concern is if you have a bar on one side of you and you have a house on the other side of you, the house can't have a party after 10, can't be outside partying after 10, but the bar I don't know what the rule is after 10, but it would be a noise complaint. But if you think about yourself in a house and your neighbor's having a party at 11 p.m., 
do you like that? And if you don't like that, then you probably need to think about a bar having one. And having done codes and stuff, I always think special use permit may be a better spot, but that is no longer in my lane. I'm just giving you an opinion. All right. Thank you. Right. Dominic. And I will do the service of keeping my opinion to myself. <laughs> Yes, because I usually have one, but uh, I know we only have 10 minutes. <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, good evening, commissioners. I appreciate uh, the time that you've taken to allow us to come and present to you. I know we only have about 10 minutes. Uh, lucky for you, A, I can talk fast. Um, B, I will try not to talk too long beyond that 10 minutes because I tend to be a little bit of a talker. So I provided the information uh, that you have in front of you. I wanted to go over it real quickly. Uh, I just wanted to give you an idea on kind of the standing of municipal courts. So if this is repeat information, I apologize. Hopefully uh, you learn a little something. Can you hear me okay? All right. So your first page that I, that I handed out, which is not the PowerPoint, I'll, I'll forward that. I tried to keep that those slides to a minimum. Uh, references specifically Kansas City, Kansas Municipal Court. Uh, the Municipal Court is considered a court of limited jurisdiction, having responsibility for all adult misdemeanors, which occur in the city of Kansas City, Kansas, with a few exceptions. Uh, we have specialty dockets for both DUI and domestic violence cases. Acting on tickets written by KCKPD, the Sheriff's Office, Railroad Police, KU Med Police, uh, Kansas City, Kansas code enforcement officers, uh, Kansas City, Kansas animal control officers, and parking control officers. Uh, something that, that I, I think isn't common knowledge. Uh, I think people only associate municipal court with PD and that's it. Uh, by having the municipal court uh, handle all of those adult misdemeanors, uh, it takes that burden off of the district court, uh, which allows the DA's office then to focus on more serious felonies. If those were actually handled by the DA's office, they have to assign a detective to investigate each case, uh, causing kind of a bottleneck of backed up cases, which is a waste of money and resources. So uh, we find that better to handle and address those things through municipal court. The municipal court requires regular, semi-regular, and occasional interpretation for the following languages. And I just looked at the languages over this past year, just to give you an idea demographically, what, what our community looks like. So Spanish, which, which is uh, very prevalent, uh, Swahili, Burmese, Nepali, Kurundi, Chin, Hmong, Karen, Kinyarwanda, Hakka Chin, Chuki, Somali, Vietnamese, and Mandarin. That's just this past year. Um, it, it, it changes and, and we tend to see uh, so, some fluctuations in those languages, but anywhere from about 13 up to about 16 languages is, is the norm for us, uh, finding those interpretation services. Whether you know it or not, the municipal court consists of 22 full-time positions. So we have two full-time judges, uh, we have myself as court administrator, a program supervisor, program coordinator with those uh, staff underneath that they supervise. We also have three pro tem judges that we can call on when necessary, uh, if a judge is, is uh, sick or on vacation, something like that. I, I think it's important for you to, to see that, that staff ratio because uh, the KCK Municipal Court regularly hears 40 to 45,000 cases per year. Uh, those are broken down on the graph that you can see from 2018 to 2021 over the last four years. I tried to simplify it and break it into essentially misdemeanor traffic and parking, as I did with the other municipalities, because everybody codes things a little differently. But we, we, if we can sort of put them underneath that umbrella to give you an idea where those percentages fall. I did that because the second page is about Wichita, Kansas. I compare KCK to Wichita, which I know is a little, maybe not the norm, and people wonder, well, gosh, why wouldn't you, you know, compare us to KC Mo? Uh, a, they're Missouri, we're not, so that's, that's the main reason. Uh, but the other municipalities, which I'll get to here in a minute. The primary reason behind Wichita is because Wichita, while it has a larger population, it is actually more racially and and economically similar to Kansas City, Kansas, than what some of our neighbors are to the South. Um, just to give you an idea, Wichita Municipal Court, they're also limited jurisdiction. They're authorized under their city ordinance to adjudicate violations of the city code. Um, they're similar in that 
and that they have two divisions, court clerk's office and probation office. Uh, we operate our own probation division as well. The, the largest difference is uh, full-time positions for them equal 80. They have 21 pro tem judges uh, with an additional four pro tem judges that specifically hear domestic violence dockets. They average anywhere from about uh, 55 to 65,000 cases. So roughly on average 15,000 more cases per year than what we do, but with uh, more than three times the staff. So I, I wanted you to see that, that with the, the staff that we have and the large amount of cases that we hear on an annual basis, uh, we, you really get a lot of bang for your buck. Because, because, you know, when you, when you look at Wichita and you look at uh, the amount that they have uh, to include their budget, I mean, Wichita has a, their municipal court has a budget of just over 11 million. Um, ours is just under two. To be clear, so, we're not asking for people or budget right now. We're just giving well, you right, information. Yeah, man, you know, I just, I just, <laughs> just so everybody you, uh, knows. <laughs> right. Right. So uh, we can go to the slides. What I didn't want to present this and only compare to specifically Wichita um, because I thought that was that was maybe unfair or might seem a little skewed. And so I wanted to make sure that you saw a couple of other municipalities that were in closer proximity to what we are. So I picked two cities, Overland Park and Olathe, that are both comparative in size, median household income is not apples to apples by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but so you can get an idea of what those municipal courts look like in com compared to KCK and Wichita. And so on this first graph, what I did was I broke out uh, the races that they have listed, uh, KCK and Wichita, and then again, Overland Park and Olathe. You can see that KCK and Wichita are more similar in nature. While certainly not exact, we are much more diverse city uh, with, within Kansas, certainly, but it's more closely related than both Overland Park and Olathe, who, who tend to be very similar. Uh, and, and then in addition, uh, looking at that median income, where in KCK, it's around 45,000, uh, Wichita is 55, so even 10,000 greater. But when you look at, at, at our neighbors to the south, you've got Overland Park and Olathe, where you've got 91,000 uh, in Overland Park and 94,000 in Olathe. So it, that's, that's a big disparity uh, in, in the median income. And, and I think it speaks directly to the, the citizens that we serve. The next slide just graphs this out per year, 2018, 2019. Again, to give you an idea with those uh, cases broken down between misdemeanors, traffic, parking, and then kind of a yearly total. So you can see uh, 2018 was pre-pandemic. We saw, every city saw a decline beginning in 2019, 2020, even through 2021, and it's starting to pick back up now. Uh, but when you look at 18, you can see what those yearly totals look like for KCK, right at almost 43,000, 60,000, 60,005 in Wichita, Overland Park 31, and Olathe 30. Uh, skipping ahead to 2019, you've got 38 there here in KCK, 55 in Wichita, uh, again, 21 and 29 respectively, Overland Park and Olathe. 2020 and 21, uh, with 2020 being kind of that real big dip due to the pandemic, uh, 32 here in KCK, uh, 53 in Wichita, 15 in Overland Park, and 20 in Olathe. And then starting to come back up here in, in 21 with uh, almost 35 in KCK, 37 actually in Wichita, 16 in Overland Park and 18 in Olathe. Right now uh, with KCK, we are just over 12,000 cases backlogged due to the pandemic. We anticipated taking uh, at least 18, possibly as many as 24 months to catch that backlog up. Uh, a lot of that is due to the fact that the staff or the staff that we have with, with only two full-time judges and three pro tems. Uh, additionally, logistically, we, we have two courtrooms. So uh, trying to take care of that regular business of forty to 45,000 cases a year and the backlog on top of it, it's going to take a little bit of time. So certainly over the next 18 months. Um, 
Wichita is not behind right now. I checked with them specifically. They actually closed their court down for 69 days uh, completely. And I asked them, how long did it, what kind of a backlog do you have? And they said, well, right now, none. And I said, well, how long did it take you to get your backlog taken care of? Four months. So to give you an idea on what kind of difference that makes and, and what we're dealing with. And again, like Judge said, we're certainly not asking for, for positions. We're not asking for money. I just want you to understand uh, as commissioners what the municipal court looks like and, and kind of what we're working with. All right. The closure for us too, while it was that way, is just the basic way that our building is set up um, to have the high load of people, four people on an elevator, the, the courtroom. So I just wanted you guys to know that um, that's just kind of a safety protocol. Um, a lot of the other courts are um, have bigger holding areas where they can bring them in, kind of like we did down in the basement. Um, one other thing I'd like to draw your attention to that's not on here, I actually saw it in another presentation, is Kansas City, Kansas for a basic traffic ticket, your basic infraction um, is the lowest in the state. We are at $80 plus $23.50 in uh, state fees. So that puts us as the lowest any place the state pays for a basic traffic misdemeanor. Um, you know, they, they go up. Um, they're all pretty close, I think but we are the, actually the lowest. So I'll just add, I don't know how I am on time because I forgot to look at my watch. Is anybody timing me? Okay, so as an added bonus, you didn't get this information, but just to give you an idea on municipal court, we, we're, we're, we do our best at trying to figure out ways to be more efficient, more cost-effective. And so aside from from changing logistically the way second floor looks uh, on where some of our staff work, where people wait when they're there for court. Uh, we've added technology to the courtrooms themselves, uh, not only to make it more accessible for, for defendants, uh, but to try and expedite those hearings. In addition, we, we're re, we've, we've purchased some kiosks to set up outside the courtroom so that when defendants come, they can sign in. Uh, so we can hear those individuals uh, in a timely fashion and in the order that they arrive. So, so as not to make anybody feel like, you know, they got here before somebody else, but they have to wait. Uh, so we can also run reports from that, that kiosk app to tell us how long it takes somebody from the time they enter court to the time they leave. Uh, we've changed some of the processes uh, through our cashiering window just to make it a little more inviting, uh, make, make, make things a little bit quicker. Uh, we work every day on customer service. Um, nobody is happy coming to court. And so um, we realize that and, and we work really hard at making sure people feel, feel uh, that, that they're treated fairly, that they're welcomed, that uh, we're empathetic and we understand that, you know, their time is valuable and we're doing everything we can to, to make their time spent in court as short as possible. So just to give you an idea on, on the things that we work on every day. We also have our own probation division, uh, something that um, is, is I'm really excited about because it allows us an opportunity to do some things for the community that uh, maybe otherwise couldn't happen. Uh, most people's introduction to the judicial system will be through municipal court. Um, and it's an opportunity to help identify some of the issues and barriers that, that our citizens face uh, that, that might lead to bigger and, 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 and worse decisions that, that uh, lead them down that path to consistently being involved uh, with, with the judicial system. And so uh, we're working on, on ways to, to intervene and, and get involved with individuals at an early stage to help uh, overcome some of those things that, that will prevent that from happening. So unless judge has something else, I, I'll stop talking and, and answer any questions that you have. I'm good. I don't know who is first. So if you want to vote, okay, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, uh, Chair uh, Markley. Um, you may have spoken about this while I was out, but the disparities relative to your parking, the disparities between Kansas City, Kansas, Overland Park and Olathe seem very, it's a, there's a cavern there, not including, um, it's not including uh, who's the blue, Wichita. But mm -hmm. can you talk about 
why we have so so high um, a number of parking cases. I believe, I'm sorry to mean to interrupt. I believe it's the case. We don't do the traffic enforcement. We just are the, the collectors of the, the, the revenue and the trial setters. I think a huge part of enforcement is the KU Med area because there's a huge parking problem around KU Med. <laughs> I, we've been asking Commissioner Ramirez to fix that for years, and he has not wanted. That's why I turned my mic off. <laughs> Apparently, it's because he's been hanging out at the Mockingbird Lounge. Too. <laughs> Just saying. I didn't mean to cut you off. Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Commissioner Markman. Yeah, I'm very well aware of the, the, the parking issues around KU Med, and that, that is something that I'm going to try and work with KU on in the community as a whole. But um, just overall, thank you for what you do for the municipal court. I know you, you interact with people when they're in a state of vulnerability, um, when they come before you, so thank you for what you do. And I, if you don't mind, would like to one day come down to municipal court. I have yet to come see what uh, see our municipal court, so I would like to come one day. <laughs> not for a parking yeah, ticket. No, not. Yeah. You're welcome You're, anytime. Not as also, a defendant, but also, <laughs> absolutely. Um, right now, we are still live on YouTube on Monday mornings and Tuesday mornings, and that's a really big spot where if you just want to pop on and just kind of get an idea, it's, it's a little more awkward than people being in because it's harder to give the announcements, but you can kind of get a really good sense of what type of cases we handle all at one time. Um, you can just go through um, on our website and click on YouTube and watch the stars in action. But you're welcome any anytime. Yeah, I'd love to have any of you down there, especially after we finish out the changes and walk you through and explain kind of what that process looks like for, for everybody. That'd be great. And then, uh, Commissioner Ramirez, we just did our final interview for the CCFFJ that we talked about. Um, so we're supposed to know in July, we feel like that went well. So hopefully the next time you hear from municipal court, you'll be getting an update about that. Kudos to judge on that because she did a lot of that heavy lifting. Yes. Thank you for that judge. Thank you. I have a question about the, um, categories. So municipal court has specialty dockets for DUI and domestic violence. And I don't see DUI at all. Is it in the traffic count? So DUI is, is a misdemeanor. Some of them are captured under traffic. Some of them are captured under misdemeanor. Um, and that's the reason I split it the way I did, uh, because to try and, and go through our system manually, because I can't run a report that will divide them out like that. Um, it, it's it would take days and days and days. So that so, is yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, that is one of the reasons why we're excited about being able to get rescue plan money for the new court management. Gotcha. The court management system we use now is the KCMO one. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? Any other questions? Well, I personally know uh, the judge and Dominic are always looking for ways to improve efficiency in their department. And that's just something that I respect. And I'm really glad you guys finally got to come and speak with us. I Thank you. Your patience, like I said, both tonight and in, in leading up to this as we kept um, shoving, you, shoving you around <laughs> there. So thanks so much. That's fine. Here. We'd much rather have a happy uh, group of commissioners than uh, a super overworked <laughs> set. So thank you. Thanks have for having day, us. Guys. All right. Item number five uh, is a presentation. Uh, on the revised 2022 and proposed 2023 community development budget. That will lead right into item six uh, from our same team. So we'll welcome them up here for the remainder of our meeting. Wilba, come on up. Well, I can guarantee you, nobody here wants to keep you here any longer than needed, so. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, uh, good evening, commissioners. I'd like to introduce uh, three other members of my staff. Joe Monzo, who's our housing program supervisor. CC Anderson, or Cecilia Anderson, who's our fiscal program supervisor. And Stephanie Stauffer, who's our grants administrator. I am going to start with the budget. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and then Stephanie and Joe will be doing the departmental update. I know you all have seen us several times this year and probably you're tired of us, that's why we're hoping it'll go fast. <laughs> okay, um, 
Some of you have had our budgets time and time again every year, so you're used to this format that we use. The 2022 revised budget is the adopted budget from last year when you adopted it, and ours was in July, I believe. And um, any reappropriations left over from the funds in 21. So it looks out of line with the 23 budget, but it's only because of the reappropriations. <clears throat> The proposed 2023 budget is what you've already seen on the draft five-year plan that you got last month. So really the only numbers that you haven't seen are the revised 2022. But I'll just walk down them real quick um, and then try to answer any questions. On the community development block grant program, the home repair program is where we do services for people of low moderate income. We always put around 500,000, there was money left over from last year. So we have 601,000 for this year. Any money left over this year will automatically go into next year's budget. The public services is an annual uh, budget. Usually we only have 20 for livable. They're a little bit behind because of the pandemic and uh, not being, you know, having the, the ability to do things. But I do know that they recently asked for some computers and so I expect to see some of this money go away yet this year. Uh, Willa Gill Multi-Service Center had money left over last year also. Uh, the NRSA initially is, is the last of the five-year um, of the five-year projects over the NRSA at, at City Park or what do we call it, uh, Park Drive NRSA. Uh, the infrastructure, public facility improvements, the roof at the domestic violence shelter we brought to you, I believe, last month to get approval for it. Um, and then uh, the 500,000, I know Commissioner Johnson's gonna ask this question, for fiscal year infrastructure slash public facilities, that's our bucket, okay, Commissioner? And what we're looking at, we went back and looked at some of the meetings that we've had, some of the public meetings that we've, we've received comment from and the uh, uh, projects that we're looking at right now, we've checked with uh, planning, we've checked with uh, Parks and Rec, is the Boston Daniels Park, and some maybe uh, improvements at Parkwood Park, like a trail sidewalk. What I wanna caution you about is we can't do maintenance. I know that there are some problems with those historic stone walls and that would probably be maintenance work. So if we could find other avenues of money, you know, we could do other things at those parks, but we can't do maintenance at those parks. The housing management inspections are all of the housing uh, management inspections for all of our funds, whether it be uh, home funds, ESG funds, where we go out and look at uh, client, you know, rental properties and any of the other, the lead-based paint print program, all of that, and then program administration. So that was CDBG's budget. Any questions on CDBG, Commissioner Johnson? <laughs> go ahead, Commissioner Biden. Yes. I just back up to the very top item, home repair. In the packet, it's revised 22601, mm -hmm. proposed 23500. Is that right? Is that yes. what you said? Yes. And the 601 is because last we year we had carryover. Yes. yes. So if we have carryover again, we'll now does it roll? Like if, well. HUD has a uh, limitation now. I believe it's a five year. You have five years to spend. Okay. We used to budget by first in, first out. Well, now we are. What you budget for this year is for that year, and you gotcha. have to spend it within five years. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next budget is the home program budget. It also has quite a bit of money uh, in this year because of reappropriations. However, one of the things that I'm asking commission to look at is uh, not funding the CHIP down payment assistance program anymore. We have had to change our formula for giving a, a assistance based on some new numbers that came out. Cecilia attended training, what, two, three years ago. And where we used to give them a blanket up to $15,000 or 14,999, HUD is saying, no, that's not how you have to really calculate it out and only give them what they need. Our lenders consortium didn't like that, the group of lenders that we had. And we have just not had any successful since late 2019. So we thought, okay, fine. 
we need house top, you know, rooftops. So let's go ahead and put the money in new construction rehab for not only our Chodos, but also for any other developers. And one of the things that we've all discussed, all four of us have discussed is, you know, in the past we funded Mount Carmel, it's a Chodo, CHWC, who's a Chodo, and Habitat, who has done regular business with us. And I'm suggesting to staff that we make it competitive. Uh, let's talk about all of you turn in, you know, and it's only going to be a one time for this, this big chunk of money, but all of you turn in a request. We're going to give you so long to get it built, so long to sell it. You know, you have to qualify. Your capacity has to be there. It can't be just a one-man show. And, and we're getting some of those where the people are, you know, wanting to be a one-man show and hire builders. And then they go out and they can't find a builder. Or they go out and they can't get supplies because the supply chain is bad. You know, we want to make it competitive and get some more maybe developers into it. They'd still be low mod housing and it would still be within, you know, the city limits of Kansas City, Kansas. But I wanted to run that by you all because home, it also has a five-year money to spend. You have to spend it. And if you have built a house and I believe you have what, nine months to sell it or it turns into rental and we don't want to get into the rental business you know, we want to get houses built and people in them and go on, you know? So I don't know what you think. Commissioner Reinem? On the um, allocation then to the competitive build process, is it only nonprofit builders or for-profits can participate? I believe. Yes. Let me back up. So we know that through our ARPA uh, subcommittee work and community outreach and the pandemic in general, and what we can see with our own eyes in the community, that housing is probably sitting in the number one, affordable housing, sitting in the number one spot for what people want us to do with ARPA money, for one thing. Uh, secondarily, we have the coalition of churches that have come forward to ask us oh. to, um, and I think you spoke with them, mm -hmm. to ask us to create the housing fund, again, for affordable housing. So that that's what's driving my question. We have builders here who build affordable housing. We have for-profit builders here who build affordable housing and sometimes they just need some help. And so that's kind of question one. And question two is, can you build multifamily with this money? We've done duplexes. Uh, one thing before Joe starts, because I, I, I know <laughs> you're going to say something. One thing that is real important, it HUD has a limitation too on how much we can spend on building a new house or how much we can spend on rehabbing a house. Mm -hmm. So a uh, for-profit may not be thrilled about the profit margin. Go ahead, Joe. Also, you have to remember that for-profits can participate, but they still have to be sold to low-income families. The, I guess the real key to it is they're gonna be building at a loss. And that's typically why we see nonprofits. So the goal is home ownership, or right, because you said they'd be selling to a low mod family. Correct. So I think, Commissioner, that there are people that need and want to buy a house, but they're being outbid by our moderate and higher income. Certainly. Right because there just isn't enough housing. You know, it. it even if we could only build five or six a year, it's it's at least something new that's going out there. Yeah, I you know, and I, if I'm looking at the right line, it's one point three million dollars. It would also be the three hundred and eighty thousand. Both of them would be. We just don't want to. You know, it would be closer to one point five. I mean, I'm not suggesting that solves our housing problem no. by any stretch. I guess I'm just asking us to within the HUD guidelines to think about, as you had kind of done with the staff, you know, let's try something different. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just looking at my fellow commissioners too, because I just, 
you know, I just don't know the answer. I mean, obviously we don't have the answer, but he does, I don't think, you know, does it, does doing something a little bit different change the game for us in the housing arena? I mean, you sat in all the meetings, you know, exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. So yes, anyway. I, know. And I think our, our uh, organizations will be upset to be competitive, but I also think that it's time to put a little fire on them as far as getting started, getting the money spent so that, you know, we can, because they get to keep the proceeds to do the next unit, you know, and then we help them a little bit more the next time. It's, it's not, it's supposed to be a perpetual thing. And instead we end up with a bunch of them all one year trying to build and, you know, and we know costs are going up. So I just wanted, I wanted to, that we knew the down payment assistance program wasn't really working out for us anymore. So do something different. Really like the notion of because we need to. Have we built townhouses or just duplexes? Just duplexes. <clears throat> and it could be that some of them are interested in creating rental, but we don't want to get involved in the rental. We don't want one of them to build a house and not be able to sell it and then try to give it back to us to rent it. Also, when, when you start talking about multifamily, you have to be kind of careful with what you're building also, because when you get in, you hit trigger points for things like Davis baking, prevailing wages, for these jobs, and all of a sudden now you've escalated cost even more. So those are things we have to watch also. I don't disagree with what you've brought. I agree with, you know, numbers wise. So I'm certainly not questioning that at all. I like the, what you're saying. If it's a matter of needing us, do we need to approve anything? Here? No. Okay. This is a, for, yep. this will be adopted when you adopt the regular budget. We will be coming to you in July to adopt the five-year plan. Okay. That's the one that's got to be done quickly. You agree? Well, we have a, well, we, I'm sorry. This is your me time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For me, at least, I will have forgotten this conversation by the time we uh -uh. <laughs> the table next month. And I don't know, I kind of want to make sure that we collectively have a good understanding of what we're going to be approving at that particular time. Um, is there any way that for you to make sure that we understand these items again, you know, that we've, that you've extracted and saying to us, hey, look, this is what we are proposing to you that we talked to you last month about that's going to get approved tonight? Well, we are doing a public hearing, but Go ahead. Yeah, and also this like reappropriation we're talking about is past year money. The plan is going to be money moving forward, so it doesn't necessarily relate necessarily. But I, I would suggest when you come to us, there's nothing wrong with saying things like, "If you recall, when we spoke with you in late June, we said." Just like I just did a while ago, what do you recall yes. that we did the draft plan? Yes. It's, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. We, our brains get very full and, and, it's, and we need to know. I can say, especially about when we have the public hearing for uh, the five-year plan, I can for sure say a change to the home program is that we've eliminated the CHIP program and have now are concentrating on new housing and, and new construction and, and rehabilitation for new, new units. I can say that, Commissioner, is that, Commissioner Johnson, is that? Well, yes, and I guess the only other part that I would ask about is the competitive process to make sure that we understand that that's gonna be part of what will be approved um, in, as part of your budget. Okay, and I came to you all for feedback on that. So if you're all thinking it's good. I just don't know what I think right now. Um, you like it? I, I do. I, I, I. Because I appreciate the where they're coming from with the 
timelines and things like, and again, I just feel like this is urgent. In my opinion, I feel that it's urgent. So I can do that. I can. Yeah. I, I mean, and it doesn't, I mean, the numbers are the numbers. I, I, I always uh, tie back to what uh, Jim Walters would talk about making substantial impact. You know, when we talk about um, building, building, you know, in, in, uh, in increasing our uh, housing stock. Right. Um, rather than doing the ones and twosies, we need to do whole blocks. And that kind of thought process is what I'm still wrestling with right now. You know, too, the staff, Joe and uh, Stephanie, have both been researching. We feel like sooner or later there's going to be some sort of housing money come down from the federal government. We don't know how and, and what shape it'll be in, but setting a precedent so that it can be competitive would be worth it. I think the UG's time. I'm good with it. I have okay. another question. We'll go on to the emergency. Did you say you had another question or you? Um, have we got to the NRSA yet? Yep. Okay. No, we'll, actually, we've passed it. Budget white. <laughs> <laughs> but Commissioner, Joe will give you an update on it in the second part of our presentation. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, ESG is the Emergency Solutions Grant Program. It is the homeless agencies. And again, they had money left over from the previous year. This is our regular allocation. This is not the COVID money. And they go through an RFP process every year. Agencies uh, compete for funding from this. Okay. Oh, you're, go ahead. Uh, we're bringing up lead-based paint. This should be the last year. We're in the last year. We're closing it out. We're uh, uh, we just brought up the budget, not that we'll spend all of this, but we just brought up the budget so that we have budget available to finish out everything that we're doing. Joe and Cecilia are in the process of doing their current quarterly report, and we'll be doing a final quarterly report. They're working with Washington, D.C., because uh, that's where the main office is for that. Here is the CDBG and ESG COVID dollars. Uh, CDBG, we have allocated about, about a million dollars, or 1.2 million. Um, we have money left that we're going to talk about at some other time in this conversation. The ESG is, again, allocated to the agencies that went through a process. And then the home ARP, Stephanie's going to discuss with you as soon as this presentation is over. So I'm done, unless you have more budget questions. And Joe and... Okay. Go ahead. Any additional? Uh, yes, I do have. I, I I think I'm supposed to ask this question. Um, with regard, I know we had some conversations with uh, MCRC, Mount Carmel Redevelopment Corporation, about them needing more dollars. They did get more dollars they last did. year. Okay. Was that that was that? But that was, I was also thinking about Willa Gill. Was that part of that discussion? It, yes, Mark Carmel is the nonprofit that runs, that runs Willa, Willa Gill. Gill. Yes. And, um, and they remember, still had monies left over. So they had money left over? Last year, they had a little bit of money left over. Okay. Uh, that commission got that request late fall. And I think that it came in, yeah, 58,000. And they came in with a new contract amount in January. Okay. I think that that's how, but the, remember the money for the contract was out of the UG general fund. This is the CD funds that okay. we didn't get involved in that increase. Okay. 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 Thanks for clarifying that. Thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe and Stephanie and let them give you a short update. We've limited it based on time constraints. Yeah. And I was going to say, just to be clear, we mentioned it earlier, but that was for information only because it'll come back as part right. of the regular budget, budget package. So we're moving on to the update now. We didn't have to take action on that last part. Okay. Great. Um, my name is Stephanie Stauffer and I'm a program coordinator with the community development department. Can you hear me? I can't always tell if I'm... Okay. Thank you. Is that too loud? Oh, no. Okay. Um, and Joe's going to present with me as well later on the slides, but um, the community development department is 100% grant funded through entitlement grants that come to the uh, city of Kansas City, Kansas from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, and those three entitlement grant programs are the community development block program, the home investment partnership program, um, and the emergency solutions grants program. Um, in most cases, we receive these grants and we work with other agencies um, to deploy the grant funding into the community. And so 
Um, that's other UG departments like Parks and Rec, Public Works, um, local nonprofits, and here's a list of some of our nonprofit partners here, um, and also local contractors who carry out like our home repair program and things like that. Um, some of our programs under the, each of these grants is for CDBG, we do public facilities and infrastructure improvements, um, our home repair program, which is a big chunk of CDBG funding, um, and then public services, which is Willa Gill. Um, and uh, livable neighborhoods. With ESG, we deploy those to nonprofits and they um, get the money out to folks who need it. Um, and that's rapid rehousing uh, projects, homelessness prevention projects, and emergency solutions um, operations funding, or emergency shelter operations funding. And then for home, we focus on new construction, rehab of affordable homeowner housing typically. Um, and then Joe is gonna give an update on the NRSA. Um. Our NRSA area, we started in 2017. This is going to be our last year. We started at Reagan Park. Um, we did a walking trail around the shelter house, made it ADA accessible. Also, from 25th and Riverview into the park, we did some infra infrastructure work there with curbs and sidewalks and overlaid the parking lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. After that, we moved over to City Park. We're at the top of the hill by the main shelter house. We moved the restroom from over the edge of the hill to the top of the hill, made that entire area ADA accessible there. And then down below, we put in a new service road to the new restroom we put in down on the bottom side of City Park, made it ADA accessible there. We also did improvements at the shelter, which included fixing the electrical system there, putting in ADA accessibility sidewalks to the shelter and fixing the actual floor of the shelter that was damaged. Um, after City Park, we moved on to Clifton. We started with exterior perimeter sidewalks completely around the park. We did ADA accessibility and put a sidewalk into the park with ADA accessibility to the playgrounds. And the parking area, we're doing parking lot improvements, improving, uh, enlarging the parking lot by, I believe, four to six spaces. And currently, we are in the process of putting a splash pad and new playground in that area. We also, with some of this money, we went from 18th and Ridge and put in a connector sidewalk down to 22nd Ridge, which connected it with Clifton Park. And that's where we stand with the project. Commissioner <laughs> <laughs> Johnson. I was just over there a couple of days ago driving around uh, just to notice all the improvements. So I want to appreciate all the work that you all have done in that area of town. Uh, I, I, it is my hope um, that our citizens will appreciate the amount of investment that has been put into that area over there. Um, I do have some questions. That floor at the big shelter house at City Park, I, I've been made aware of, is a very special floor. Um, and what is the material that, is, that comprises that floor? That, the floor at City Park is actually a crushed rock terrazzo floor is what they call them. It's crushed kind of like a marble terrazzo. put down in there. Like marbles in there. Correct. And it is fancy, and people don't people <laughs> people don't up. realize it. I mean, that is a the, top of the notch floor. The floor on the perimeter had been damaged. Yeah. So what we did, we just saw cut back. I believe it was two and a half feet, and put in concrete to stabilize okay. the rest of the floor. Okay. Good. Good. That's a uh, very important. And of course, I we're still having restroom problems. Um, I took some pictures. I just haven't had a chance to send it to anybody. The, the restroom that's on top of the hill at City Park, there's somebody's gone in there and done it again. And so we want to continue to work on that. Um, the only other thing that I would ask is about Clifton Park. Um, I think that the uh, uh, things that have been done are great. I was just driving. I'm glad we're doing some improvements to the parking lot because even in my SUV, I was bumbling around over there. So I appreciate the fact that we're doing some improvements there. The thing that concerns me about that is the old um, Parks and Rec headquarters building. I don't know if anybody knows that that used to be over at um, Clifton Park. So 
that building is just kind of sitting there. And I know we had the whole thing where we were putting the pictures on the outside. And I think we did that. And that's great. But that that old building needs a, needs a touch of paint. Um, I, I, just because of all the other good things that we're doing over there, I think that to me, that building just kind of sitting there and we haven't figured out what we're going to do with it. I know you're going to maybe talk to, um, to Angel about it. You know, I know Angel and I have talked about it as well, but I don't know if any, if you could find a few dollars to find some paint to throw in that building. They consider that maintenance and we can't, sorry. They ask us that from the very beginning. Really? Yes. They wanted something done with the building. They wanted to use it for a community center. Something. Yeah. yeah and unfortunately, when Logan and Melissa were still here and working with SOAR, that was one of the things that they were going to address, the outside paint. And I, I personally haven't been down there to see it. I mean, I've been in the park, but I haven't paid any attention to that building over there at all. Well, you got to pay attention to that. I mean, it's close to my house, too. I should, I guess. But yeah, I'll stop by there yeah. and check it out. The other thing I did want to mention I don't see here, and it's going to be an exciting thing for uh, that district, is golf course, disc, disc golf course in uh, City Park. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. They got a lot of land over there for that. So yeah. I yeah. would. Uh, be, I thought you were going. Yeah. He's calling me out for forgetting to mention that. But we're, <laughs> <laughs> we are in the process of putting in an 18, I guess you call it, hole disc golf course. That. That, that's great. Around the, it's moving all through city park, so to speak. Gotcha. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I was supposed to talk to you about this $500,000 pot of money. <laughs> another day, another time. Commissioner Bynum. Can you tell us um, all of the nice improvements that we see here over the life of NRSA? What, what was the total dollars? I don't have that number tonight, but I'll be putting together a full report to close the program out probably in December. I'll make sure you get that. Yeah. That's where I was going in my head, right? Because we did the allocations we uh, away from, I don't want to misspeak. We dedicated our CDBG to NRSA. I mean, at least 500,000 every year for five years. So that would be Right there. At least 2.5. Okay. And I'm, I'm sure it is because we've had the things come up. I can remember the archaeologist uh, study that that's why we're so far behind still because we had to do that archaeologist study at City Park. And uh, we were going to do City Park North, as you recall, in the archaeologist. They wanted the association to request another report in. That's when we got the distress call from the domestic violence shelter. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't think we're going to do that, hire an archaeologist just to do that small little park up at the top of the hill. So. I had another thought, but I lost it. So, well, like Stephanie said, she was going to be doing the final report at the end, yep. so she'll make sure that. Thank you. I think I'll fill in just might not have been your final thought, but, you know, it just comes to mind for me, you know, as we talk about infrastructure and all these different things, like the impact that we made in this area. And I think it'll be interesting for us as a commission to trace the longer term impact because we can see the impact in all the beautiful things that we've created. But does that have an impact in the larger neighborhood and what kind of impact does it have? And I think it's just a good I mean, the, the idea was that for this to be that sort of guinea pig to give us those sort of ideas and um, example to follow. So I think we just have to remember as a, we have to have, we short-term commissioners have to have a long-term memory, right? We're, all, we're only guaranteed our term and there, but so it's easy for us to lose track of these longer term projects, but um, we have to keep that long-term memory to look back and say, what did we do here and what impact did it have? Because if this is successful and having an impact in that larger neighborhood, which I think it will be, that's we need to go back and be doing this in other places and we need to take that amount of money that we're seeing here and say where's the next spot so that we can have that greater impact
Well, and I'll just make an, uh, a plug for the SOAR program and their involvement in this. I mean, again, we just need to make sure we continue that institutional memory so that we don't forget that we did this great project and not look back and see what the statistical impacts have been. All right, thanks team. That item was also for information only. So we have come to the end of our meeting. We are concluded and adjourned. <laughs>